This game is rated M and is intended for mature audiences. Okay, interesting. No matter how much power you hold, no matter how wise and widely respected you may be, there's one force you're completely powerless to resist. No one in the world's capable of stopping the flow of time. True, spend enough money and you can usually prolong your life a little, but that's hardly the same as stopping or reversing the relentless march of the years. No, it won't get censored. Because that would take way too much effort to do. Back in the old days, there were rulers who fought systems of hereditary inheritance would grant them dominion over time. But open any history book and you'll find plenty of proof that was just another way of struggling in vain against the inevitable. Strict codes of law, beautiful writings, wise teachings, all these too eventually fade away. Still, there are always people who struggle against that oppressive rule, studying the failures of those who went before and seeking immortality through lines or deeds. And there are those who live efe ephemerally in the moment, ignoring the current of time uh, entirely. Perhaps that's a valid means of escape in its own right. But no matter how we, what we approach, no matter what approach we take, we're all fighting a losing battle. Some few among us, the mo among the most determined and brilliant, may manage to build a milestone. But compared to the vast and unending road itself, such monuments aren't particularly significant. Time's an absolute tyrant. Everyone's powerless to resist its might. However, if you look at the matter from another angle, time's also our supreme problem solver, the ultimate healer of wounds. Given enough time, a Gordian knot too tangled for human hands to, und <laughs> to undo will naturally slip apart and return to its original form. Through the passing of the years, a hardened clump of stone that won't dissolve underwater or melt under a fire will disintegrate all on its own. Time doesn't rule through fear alone. Like all of its truly absolute, it exerts its power indifferently over good and bad alike. You really don't have to, no. You really don't. <sighs> Running my usual morning course, I breathe in and out at my usual steady rhythm. There's no hesitation in my movements. I could run this route in my sleep by now. I'm not bothering to measure or anything, but my heartbeat and calorie burn are probably exactly the same as they were yesterday. From a long-term perspective, it'll probably only be a few years before my current peak physical condition gives way to a slow, gradual curve of decline. But looking back over the last two years, my specs have stayed exceptionally consistent. I've never been negligent in keeping myself ready for emergencies of any kind. My master really beat that lesson into me, I guess. Running comes so naturally to me that it's now very easy to detach my mind from the movements of my body. I often find myself thinking all over all sorts of things. My master was a great believer in staying on your toes, preparing for the extraordinary in the most ordinary of times. Always think ahead, always stay prepared, always follow your routine. In the course of my m monotonous daily training, there were times where everything seemed so calm that I couldn't help doubting the importance of all that. But I've been plunged abruptly into crisis often enough to recognize the peace-addled complacency for what it is. Even just over the last year, this sort of readiness proved immeasurably important. Still, I'd really like things to stay relatively peaceful for a while. Trying to drive a subtle shadow of unease from my mind, I focus on carrying out my comfortingly familiar peacetime training. The late summer sun creeps into the sky, gradually warming the earth below. I don't know what's next after Grisea, I have to think about that. It's been two months since we returned to this place, and in reality, nothing too dramatic has happened in that time. Even compared to the peaceful time I spent here before, nothing's really... Well, no. I suppose there have been a few minor changes to the previous routine. I'm back! For one thing, I've started consistently staying this phrase, me saying this phrase immediately after returning to the dorm. There were occasions when I said those words before, but... It was a pretty uncommon event, reserved for when somebody happened to be in the lobby when I opened the door. But now I've got a reason to announce my return every single time. Namely, there's always a certain someone here to say those words to. Sorry about slipping out. I was a little worried that you might not be getting enough sleep waking up at the same hour as me. Thanks. Taking the towel from Yumiko, I roughly scrub the sweat off my face. Whew. And when I look up again... She's like, oh my gosh, you're so hot, rubbing your sweat off your face. An attractive young woman standing very close to me with a distinctly wistful expression on her face. Slightly exasperated, I have a quiet sigh. Look, Yumiko, I think we've been over this before. <laughs> Waving her hands in the air, she interrupts my earnest warning in a flustered tone of voice. <laughs> Why 
Yep. Because the people who live in this building have zero tact. That's right. Glad to see you get the message after all. Look, woman. Is this seriously the same person who used to swing a box cutter at me every time we met? Apparently. Feels like two different people, though. Turning her blushing face slightly away, she flutters brief glances in my direction. Don't think I'll say this to the girl herself, but it's not far from the sort of come-hither look you'd get from pros in a red-light district. I mean, yes, I do understand this is the product of sincere affection, but seriously, when the girl's this blatant about it, it's hard not to get suspicious. Something Machina told me once comes to mind. To wit, women of the Kudere tribe are a pain in the ass. They're not used to showing affection, so once they go, do go sweet, they'll give everyone in a free mile radius cavities. Why are we quoting that? That said, giving her the cold shoulder would be just making more trouble for myself in the long run. Just yesterday, I tried brushing off Yumiko's excessive demands for public displays of affection. She retaliated with hours of sulky, reproachful glaring. Still falls well into our the cute category, but the effort involved in smoothing her feathers after the fact only amplifies the pain in the ass factor. And so I decided to give in to her demands like the hopeless sap I am. Fine, here we go. <laughs> Pulling Yumiko over to me, I embrace her lightly at arm's length. I did wipe myself down with a little towel, but I'm still just back from exercising. Can't exactly go for the bear hug. <sighs> I'm not sure if I learned anything from this game. Except how painful dialogue can be at times. Also that, uh... <laughs> apparently... Wait... No, no, I think that's it. I was going to mention something about how some cars can go 300 kilometers an hour, but... Eh. And as if to say, the hell with your thoughtfulness, the woman dives forward and nuzzles her pretty face against my chest. Already in heat, first thing in the damn morning. Really, bro? I think you're aware, but I kind of stink right now. Don't cling to me like that. This better not get gross. If your past self could see you now, she'd probably break down in tears. I think she might kill me with a box cutter. Honestly. Let me guess. All three of the other people, all four of the other people here are eavesdropping. Hey, Yumiko. Charming as it is to watch you get drunk off my body, I think it's time for you to back off now. All four people are eavesdropping right now. I pretty much guarantee it. Uh, I, I don't personally mind if you want to keep grunting in satisfaction while fondling my pecs, but I'd recommend taking a look behind you first. I want to slap her so bad. Like, if it, she seems to be just asking for it. When there's only six students in the school and five of them are girls, they literally have nothing to do but watch the one couple and, like, make fun of them. These are terrible people. You tell him, Thomas. I refuse to believe Makina's not here. Yeah, here we go. Makina trots energetically up to Yumiko, currently frozen solid. The intensity of her grin is genuinely unpleasant. Pumping Yumiko's shoulders in a companionable way, she barrages her with merciless words. The young woman in question, her hands still frozen pitifully in the air where my chest had been, looks around the lobby like a high school drama student doing their best imitation of a robot. You four do realize 
that you can have a life outside of spying on us, right? I was going to say, you guys do realize there's a TV here, but I think the TV's actually in the room that we're in right now, so they can't watch that. Why are they here? Why? Why? One by one, the others give the statue Stev Yumiko a friendly slap on the shoulders, then saunter off mocking her. There's some real affection underneath those wry smiles, but also undeniably a good deal of exasperation mixed in as well. Hey, Yumiko, are you alright? I've made an, I've made a discovery. Thinking back on all of the routes we've done. The parts of the routes that don't take place at the school were great. The parts that took place at the school usually sucked. Which is a shame, because 90% of this game takes place at the school. I'm going to take that as a no. Yumiko, stunned speechless, lets out an anguished, grunting moan of the sort I'd usually expect from Michiru. We've actually had more than a few incidents like this over the last two months, but today was... exceptionally bad. Wait, I... well, I tried to warn her. Maybe that'll be a bit of a lesson to the girl. Can only pray that she'll finally cut down on the public dare somewhat. Earth to Yumiko? I'm going back to the room now, alright? Shaking my head with a smile, I head back to my room. By manipulating the Minister of Land, Transport, and Infrastructure, we succeeded in removing Sakaki Michiaki from his role at the top of the East Beach group, putting an end to his pursuit of Yumiko. What was that purpose of that last scene? That added nothing. It just interrupted the actual story narrative to put in a cringy moment. <sighs> Again, I, I do like this game at times, but I really hate it at other times. The director we successfully raised up as an opposing power, essentially a puppet of the government, has already discontinued Michiaki's aggressive strategy of expansion in favor of a much more stable and low-risk style of management. Well, great, we replaced one puppet with another puppet, but this time it's a puppet of the government. Mm-mm. I kind of think that might be worse in the long term, but we'll see. <laughs> The East Beach Group has shed its image as the Sakaki family's personal empire. With surprising speed, it's being reformed into a very different kind of enterprise. Someday, people probably won't even remember that they were once mocked as bandits. As for Mahama Academy, it's going to be closing its doors. There were potential PR issues because of its connection to Michiaki's struggle with his daughter. And on a purely practical level, the new management took issue with the lavish, in ineffe inefficient spending that defined Mahama's administration. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to have this big, fancy, gated community building for six students. They did explore restoring it as a more conventional school, but given the location and the circumstances, it was estimated that attracting a sufficiently large student body would prove difficult. In the end, the project was simply abandoned. Then again, from beginning to end, the school never had more than six students. Putting aside the facilities and funding, once that framework changed, Mahama would still have stopped being what it was. That's a good thing. In exchange for the Academy's closure, the dormitory was allowed to op remain open in a different form. Without a school attached, it's become a simple apartment building. They entrusted the management to the former students for the time being, enabling us to continue our lives virtually the same as before. Everyone's using this place as a launch pad for the next stage of their lives. Amine will apparently be leaving to help out her family's traditional restaurant with Makina once their preparations are in order. Sachi and Michiru are going to be transferring together to a boarding school the principal recommended. That's nice, I'm glad that they'll have each other in that new school. That'll be good. However, even if we all end up leaving this place behind, we've made plans to periodically meet up again. The six of us may have been born into different places, but in a way we all feel as if we grew up here. Although we've regained our familiar daily life, little by little things are starting to change. And Yumiko is certainly no exception. After dramatically transforming her world, she's trying to adapt herself with a whole new routine. Thanks for helping with breakfast. Eating my meals around this table with Yumiko already feels completely natural. Today we've got grilled salmon and boiled greens and soy sauce that I made, and soup and rice, courtesy of Yumiko. That's breakfast? I don't know if Japanese breakfast is weird or if American breakfast is weird. Or both! I definitely think that American breakfast is weird. It's like, hey, let's eat dessert for breakfast. <laughs> this is a good idea. <laughs> I, I, I believe you have, yeah. Again, the artwork in this game is very good. Why would I lie now? It really is good. It's hard to screw up rice. Actually, no, it's not. It's pretty easy to screw up rice. Especially if you don't have a rice cooker. Her eyes full of relief, Yumiko favors me with a sincere smile. 
Since we started living together in my room, the girls gradually eased her way into cooking. At first she was burning pans more often than cooking food, but under the strict tutelage of Madame Suo Amane, she's finally learned how to make miso and other simple soups. You're learning boiled food next, right? Amane was pretty enthusiastic. Sounds like she enjoys teaching you. <sighs> yeah, well, Amane is just a messed up individual. Well, the two of them have finally gotten friendly enough to use each other's first names, so I guess that lingering tinge of jealousy isn't go anything to be worried about. Amane's probably just playing around for the most part, but since I'm clearly part of the issue, I can't exactly stick my head in either way. Seeking a change of subject, I reach out for my rice bowl. Hmm, looks like you got the rice just right, too. When I look across the table again to praise Yumiko, I find her chopsticks paused hesitantly in midair. <laughs> oh, did you forget the salt? What's wrong? You're not eating. I call out to her again. She starts a little, then smiles. <laughs> Morning light flows in softly through the window. The faint touch of sun on her skin makes Yumiko's smile seem almost eerily gentle. <laughs> Yeah, I will say Yumiko's change from Murder Girl to this was kind of dramatic. Feels maybe a tinge unrealistic for her to have been trying to kill people in the past. Just throwing that out there, that's one of my complaints with the root, but yeah. Before, Yumiko was always alone. The girl absolutely didn't choose that solitude. She always longed to have someone at her side, and many times she tried to convince herself there would be. Those hopes were betrayed again and again. Yumiko plunged into despair, gave up on connecting with others, and hid herself from the world. But after she came to this dorm, her walls slowly began to crumble. Yumiko warmed up to her classmates, she fell in love with me, and her solitude finally came to an end. Considering the way that she used to be, it's not surprising she'd find all this a little hard to believe. Yeah, I'm happy for you, Yumiko. That smile's coming from the heart. Yumiko looks genuinely content, like someone who's gotten everything they ever wanted. But when the girl talks about how happy she is, sometimes I see a very slight shadow fall across her face. And although it's just a speculation on my part, I think I know why. Through our traps, Sakaki Michiaki lost everything he had built in a single day. Tripped up by the willful daughter that he had wanted to manipulate like a puppet, the man vanished in defeat. The supremely arrogant emperor who stepped out of the car that day left a crushed and broken man. Those deeply contrasting images are still crystal clear in my memory. And for Yumiko, his daughter, that moment must have left a far stronger impression. There wasn't just hatred in her eyes as she quietly watched her father disappear. I'm sure many complex emotions were running through her mind. Following that incident, Sakaki Michiaki essentially abandoned both his personal and professional life. The mass media he'd previously muzzled through force briefly latched onto the dramatic overthrown tyrant storyline, but in time their interest died out. By now the man's already becoming part of the past. Michiaki's still got nearly a 10% stake in the group along with a new honorary position, so he shouldn't be exactly starving. Still, he's been lying low to the point that it's almost unsettling. Sometimes I can't help wondering if he's lurking in the shadows somewhere, steadily plotting revenge and working toward a comeback. But that hypothesis doesn't really stand up to scrutiny. I couldn't see any hint of the spirit in the hollowed-out shell of a man who climbed back into his car that day. And judging from the way she watched him go, Yumiko probably sensed something similar. Her father had been the focus of all of her hatred for years. He was the ruthless creature who chained her down. But underneath his armor, he was just one incredibly frail human being, every bit as weak as Yumiko herself once was. Watching her father stripped naked and chased from his place in the world, the girl no doubt felt a painful twinge of recognition of empathy. To survive, to carve out her own place in the world, there was no choice but to overthrow him. But that doesn't mean it left an entirely pleasant taste in her mouth. Yumiko? Again, there's that slight hint of listlessness in her expression. Even when Yumiko's acting cheerful, I can't help picking out these slight signs of fraying at the seams. You keep stopping your chopsticks. Well, it's generally more efficient to eat rice with a fork or a spoon than chopsticks. At least, from my standpoint. 
Maybe if you get really good with the chopsticks, it's actually more efficient, and I've been doing it wrong all this time. I've been refraining from asking Yumiko about this. She obviously hasn't be even begun to sort out her own feelings yet. It'd be just cruel to make her dwell on it even further. Alright, I know what you're thinking about. Huh? <laughs> what the? Moving smoothly around the table, I push her down to the floor. What? No! We got interrupted halfway through, didn't we? Maybe you wanted something like this? How about after breakfast? How about after marriage? So I cover it up with a white lie. And Yumiko, for her part, accepts that lie. Her words are hesitant, but her fingers twine for mine. I would not put it past the other students at all to be spying on us through the window. Not even remotely. I wouldn't put it past them to install a camera in the room and post it online. Like, I have literally the lowest possible like, opinion of the other students. Oh no! Is the OBS about to crash again? OBS is stuck at the zero kilobits a second. Oh no! No, 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 no. Nope, it disconnected again. Doggone it. We back? We back. Cool. You know, I just love how I can stream Hollow Knight, a game that was made in, like, 2017 with pretty stunning graphics, a lot of moving parts, like, very fluid animation, a lot going on all the time, and absolutely no problem. But I stream a visual novel, which is basically just still images and text, and my computer's like, Nope! Can't do that! Overheating! Ah, It's ridiculous. But we're almost done. And you know what? If it had to crash, I'm glad it crashed here and not during the credits, so everybody's... Because, you know, I can just hold off and not advance the text until we're back online, but if the credits were going, I can't pause that, so... Cool. Just don't crash again, please. Her words are hesitant, but her fingers twine through mine. As if to request the next step, her entire palm squirms coquettishly in my grasp. <laughs> there's there's a million dollar word. Your hands seem to have a different opinion. I'm not sure what who to believe. Seems she wasn't really rejecting me. I lean down and press my lips against hers. Pretending not to notice the wounds on each other's backs, we run our hands across the da undamaged surface alone, seeking comfort. Wow. I know we'll have to treat those wounds eventually. But right now, we need time. We need this. Do we, though? Yumiko hasn't had any real peace for practically her entire life. At the very least, I want to give her a chance to think. Suddenly, shrill electronic music fills the air. We stop at Smy Riley at each other. <laughs> With one more brief peck on my lips, Yumiko pulls herself up from out oh, off of me. She, sh she flips open her bleeding cell phone and glances at the screen. If OBS crashes through the credits, then you guys don't get to see it live. You'll have to see it in the YouTube VOD. Because it OBS is not crashing. My internet is cutting out, which means I don't get to stream, but I'm still recording it to my PC. So, After letting me know that, she picks herself up off the floor and presses the answer button. She got a lawyer? Yes, yes. Yes. Yumiko recently hired a lawyer to sort through the legal issues involved with our situation. He's also helping make arrangements for managing the Sakaki family's property now that Michiaki's all but fallen off of the face of the earth. The family affairs are understandably chaotic at the moment, so it's a lot for Yumiko to handle on her own. Still, she's been diligently negotiating, selling off what needs to be sold, and trying to keep things from falling apart. We're keeping the hot tub, that's, that's a must, but I assume this phone call is another update on the progress. But the peaceful conversation I was expecting changes dramatically with a small cry of surprise from Yumiko. It's not just the tone of her voice. The calm look on her face gives way to a grim and severe expression. More than a little concerned, I pick myself up off the ground and watch. <laughs> it's a surprise. We still have five hours of the route left. After hanging up the phone, Yumiko gazes down at the screen in disbelief, not speaking a word. Did something happen? This time I find myself unable to bite my tongue. Yumiko, her face still blank with shock, finally turns to face me. That man. There's nothing in the phrase to suggest Yumiko's talking about a relative, but there's only one person she refers to that way, to that way. When you say everything, like, what do you mean by that? Everything? Confusion in her eyes, Yumiko nods shortly. Interesting. 
is he retiring, or is he thinking something darker? Because as, as much of a butt that that guy was, I don't want him to kill himself. Sakaki Michiaki did? Yumiko doesn't respond. She just gazes intently down at her phone, complex emotions flitting across her face, almost as if the man in question was standing in front of her. It's the same expression that was on her face two months ago as she watched her father disappear. An expression of loneliness, anger, and profound sorrow. So that's how you say sorrow.